What's going on everybody? Welcome to Let UX. My name is Daniel Smith and I'm going to be talking to you guys today about my top five UX considerations for VR. Now this video is going to focus on video games because that's what this channel is about and that's where my special interest lies. However, this can probably be applied to most virtual reality software. A lot of it's going to be very similar in, in the functions that it may have, at least the basic functions for remote work and things like that. There are going to be some exceptions, but a lot of it is going to be consistent. Now the data on virtual reality is pretty thin. There's not a whole lot of published articles on user research in, in virtual reality because it's pretty new. It's only been consumer level for a couple of years and a lot of things have changed from the virtual reality technology that was around in the past. However, watching people play myself or even playing the games myself or looking at Reddit or whatever forum you may want to look can give you a lot of information about what users are having problems with that are consistent across a bunch of games. You can even look at games that are ported over such as Borderlands or Skyrim and see all these problems that come up that developers didn't consider because they're like, oh, well, this wasn't a problem in my console version. So why would it be a problem in virtual reality? I'm going to give you guys five categories of things that I think should be the number one considerations or one through five, I guess, the top considerations when you're doing this development before it even gets to your users. And I'll give you some examples and try to expand upon each one of them. So number one on this list is physical and ergonomic considerations. So virtual reality brought about the physical dimension to video games. Used to, we would sit in a chair, we'd have a controller, we'd use our thumbs. Now we're swinging our arms, we're swinging swords, we're holding up bows, we're drawing things back, we're squatting down, moving our head, and all these other things. And this brings about the problem of physical injury or exhaustion. So one of the number one things you should consider when developing a game is repetitive movement. Try not to make your users do the same thing over and over and over again. And if they have to, such as harvesting materials, put it at chest level, Put don't, don't put it on the ground so they have to bend over to pick it up, make them reach out in front of you and allow people, which if you're in resource harvesting, they can just move toward it, but make sure they can reach it without fully extending their arm because that puts a lot of pressure on your shoulder. It's gonna make people tired. And on the same token of this category, a bunch of different people of different fitness levels are going to be playing your game more than likely. So make sure you it doesn't require a high level of fitness in order to play it. Allow for different play styles so that people who aren't very physically fit can still play it their way and they don't have to stop every 10 minutes. Number two on this list is immersion and presence. So we want to get immersed in virtual reality. We have that physical dimension now and we've experienced immersion in console gaming, but it's not the same as in VR. In VR, we forget that the real world exists and we're just, we just know the world that's in front of us. And a couple ways that you can help make sure your users are immersed are one, don't make me think about the real world. And the number one way, in my opinion, that developers make me think about the real world and break my immersion is mapping things to buttons. Stop using buttons if you can avoid it. Use gestures, use whatever people reaching to certain parts of their body to grab backpacks and things like that. But if you can avoid mapping to buttons, please do, because then I have to think about the controller, which is in the real world. Think about where the button is, and that breaks my immersion. The next thing is use appropriate audio and visual cues. So whenever I'm fighting a bear in an RPG, I would expect it to growl at me. And if it does, that's what I expected. I'm still immersed. If it doesn't, I'm like, oh, this isn't a real bear. This is a virtual world. This isn't what I expected. And that, that's breaking my immersion. And as far as visual cues go, use an art style that's appropriate for your game. If you're creating an RPG, a fantasy RPG, don't use hyper-realistic graphics. Use a, a a, at least a slightly playful cartoony style because this is fantasy. This isn't real. It's not supposed to look real. And this is also my opinion. Some other people might have a different opinion on this, but different art styles are appropriate for different kinds of games, which can affect their immersion. Number three on this list is virtual reality sickness. And now this is something that plagues a huge part of the virtual reality community. And I personally don't suffer from it, at least not to a very large extent, but a lot of people do. So it's something that really needs to be considered if you want to expand your user base. Now this, the most common of cause of this is locomotion. And so a huge consideration for this is to give options. Make sure you have teleportation and natural locomotion in your game. If you wanna put in something else that you created, that's fine, but give these two options. Teleportation can be used by people who get sick really commonly, or for people like me who don't get sick and I prefer to be more immersed over worrying about the VR sickness, I wanna use natural locomotion. So just give us both options. And when you do that, make sure they're the same speed. Because if you make one a different speed, personally, 
I'm someone who wants to quickly move forward in the game. When I have an idea, oh, I want to go do this in this game, I want to get there as quickly as possible. So if you make one of them faster than the other, you're forcing me to use that one, even though I might prefer the other one. So make sure that the same speed and you offer both of them. And if you do put in your own special locomotion, don't force users to use that. Number four on this list is a little less broad, and that is avoid flat menus. Flat menus are almost completely unnecessary in virtual reality. If you want to immerse me in your game, make something that is similar to the game. Make the UI something that I can interact with that is related to your game. And this goes along something in psychological research called the schema theory, which suggests that if we can use prior knowledge in order to interact with this, this user interface, it's going to be more intuitive. We're going to be able to navigate it more easily, figure it out without as much direction, and we're going to enjoy it more. It's just going to make sense to us. So a good example of this is Fantastic Contraption, where they almost completely avoided flat menus. Obviously, there are some times when you have to use one, but a lot of times it can be avoided. And in order to save one of your contraptions, instead of just clicking save, you grab it, you put it on a table, saves it for you, you can flip it over, put it over, you know, you don't have to interact with buttons and things like that. You're interacting with the world and you can use information that you've gathered based on playing the game to interact with that menu. And in my opinion, this is the a, a huge consideration for VR that people just ignore. A really bad example of it is Skyrim. Skyrim VR just poured it over the regular menus and replaced the thumbstick with the trackpad and it is completely unusable. If you've played it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then find a mod that, that fixes the UI because it's impossible. I'm currently doing an evaluation of that game, so I can't change it because I want to do the original. But I can tell you that it ruins the experience. It's a fun game, but that UI is unusable. So if you can, avoid flat menus. And if you're going to use flat menus, at least make it one that I touch, one that I'm going to interact with and not just point a laser at and click on. Number five on this list is one that can be applied to most UX and not just VR, and that's that options are king. If you can give me options to do a whole bunch of different things, you're probably going to hit something that I want to do. You want to, you're going to have all kinds of different users with all kinds of preferences out there. And if you can give an option for each one, then that's fantastic. And the best way to figure out how you should do this is do user testing before you release. If you have the resources, bring some users in, let them play and give you their thoughts. And they'll tell you, I wish I could have done this. I wish you would let me do this. I want to do this and so on and so forth. And you're going to know, okay, these are the options that I need to put in in order to cater to all of these different kinds of users. Bring in somebody who knows you or someone who can help you create personas or whatever you want to do, whatever you have the resources for, but make sure you know what your users want and give them the option to do that. It will support play style, different play styles. It will support replayability and it will definitely make your game a much better experience. All right, everyone, there you have it. My top five UX considerations for VR are physical and ergonomic considerations, immersion and presence, VR sickness, avoid flat menus if possible, and options are king. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you guys want to see more game UX content. We're going to hopefully be covering a whole wide range of content and maybe topics like motivation in games or various things in just game UX. And we're also going to be covering specific games and break them down into their UX principles and give some recommendations, the good and bad, so on and so forth. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch this video.